Well, today on the show, we're discussing God, Stephen Hawking and the multiverse. That's the title of a new book by David Hutchings and David Wilkinson that traces how Stephen Hawking changed the way we think about the universe and how his ideas have shaped the conversation about God, science and where everything came from. David Hutchings is a physics teacher from York. He's written several books about the relationship between science and religion. And he came on this show a couple of years ago, probably now, Dave, uh, with Tom McLeish at the time to do a similar sort of discussion. Uh, David Wilkinson is principal of St. John's College, Durham University, where he's professor of theology and religion. Also a former guest on this show. I think, David, it was when you wrote your book on uh, extraterrestrial life and that kind of thing. And it was a a really really interesting discussion. Um, And you're an ordained minister, David. Um, You have a background, though, in astrophysics, PhD. Uh, you, You write and speak widely, obviously, on Christianity and science. And Phil Halper comes back to the show as well. It's all former guests of one sort or another. Uh, Phil, as our our sceptical atheist guest today, runs the YouTube channel Skydive Phil, where he has interviewed many of the leading physicists in the world on cosmology and astrophysics, including Stephen Hawking, actually, before he passed away in 2018. And uh, Phil's taken a personal interest over the years in the dialogue between Christianity and physics, as he thinks that scientific theories have often been wrongly interpreted or misused by Christians to lend weight to the God hypothesis. So today we're going to be asking uh, what space Stephen Hawking's theories about singularities, quantum mechanics and the universe actually left for God and whether contemporary physics is a friend or foe of the notion of a divine creator. Uh, So welcome everyone from our various spare rooms in lockdown for today's edition of Unbelievable. Great, great to see you all. Um, Let's start with Dave and David. Um, uh, Give us a sense of this book. First of all, uh, Dave, uh, you're a physics teacher. Um, first of all, I, I guess life in lockdown means, um, you know, school, ca- school was out early, um, but it must be a bit, a bit of a challenge teaching your students remotely at the moment. Yeah, it was a lot harder doing it from my, uh, my office on a laptop than it is in a lab when you can actually pull pieces of equipment out of cupboards and, and demonstrate things or turn around to a giant whiteboard and start jotting down ideas. So learning to do that just on a, a live chat with 20 teenagers, especially when they discover that they can, uh, they can put memes and, uh, <laughs> and give some pictures in oh, whilst dear. you're trying to explain something is a interesting. Flood of, a flood of emojis, yes, as you're trying to explain uh, particle physics or something. Um, anyway, uh, good to have you on the show today, um, Dave. And David Wilkinson, you're obviously um, facing similar issues with no students on site currently uh, at Durham University. That's right, no students on site in a college which was built for students and the whole uh, philosophy of bringing different subjects together into conversation, but we're having those conversations online, we're doing teaching online. And I find myself in the surreal experience of talking about Stephen Hawking from my son's former bedroom. Uh, he got married last summer, moved out, but I have to say the smell didn't move out. Okay. That's still, still well, here. So I'm glad, I'm that's glad where the tech- I am. I'm glad the technology hasn't advanced enough for us to have smells as well in that case. Um, uh, Phil, welcome along to the program as well. Uh, Another person broadcasting from some room in their house. Um, Yeah, uh, lockdown for you. Um, You're a jet setter, so I can imagine you can't go on all those interesting parts of the world that you're no we we had a trip but to chernobyl and that would have been a safer place than here maybe (laughs) so no none of that's none of that but we've had very clear skies so i've had the telescope out a lot and that's yeah um and i hope we'll get to see some of those pictures in 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 a little moment um but before we we see some of that uh david and dave tell us about why you decided to write a book on god stephen hawking and the multiverse uh dave would you like to kick us off yeah um When Hawking died in 2018, I think that it gives you a chance to really think about what someone has done, what they've achieved. Uh, A lot of newspapers and magazines and TV programming looking at the massive impact that he had, who he was as a person, but also the ideas that he came up with. Uh, I was approached by a publisher having already written a popular level science book with another academic uh, to consider writing a book about Hawking's life and his work. And I said, well, why don't you ask David Wilkinson, um, who I knew via uh, other connections, because when I was a teenager, and I really do want to make that point again, when I was a teenager, um, I got this book, (laughs) God, Time and and Stephen Hawking, uh, written by David Wilkinson. Um, And uh, 
I, so I thought, well, he's got to be the guy to do it, right? He's done this before. Um, when David was approached, he said, well, why don't we do it together? And that's what's happened. Um, I think that the teaching job really is, uh, or part of teaching is to go and get stuck into the complicated ideas and listen to the experts and then think, right, how do you present this to uh, people who are not experts? And I think it's quite similar to what Phil does in a lot of ways. Um, and nice and part of what we try, try to do through the Unbelievable show as well, yeah, we're often trying to distill big ideas into kind of something that's accessible for, for a wide audience. Um, and I think you really have done that actually with this book. And I know Phil's going to disagree with some aspects of it, but, but I have to say for myself, um, you will come away knowing a lot more if you, if you didn't know much about this area before in a way that's comprehensible as well, um, which I think in itself is a great achievement. Um, uh, David, uh, yeah, I, I mean, you, you actually obviously have, have met Stephen Hawking. You've followed, obviously, his career. Uh, we, we've kind of got this media image of him, obviously, which was, you know, increased by that film that came out, The Theory of Everything, detailing his life and so on. Uh, why, why has he been such a hugely significant popular public figure during the whole of his life? Well, uh, yes, and thank you, Dave, for reminding me just how old I am in terms of... <laughs> Uh, you reading something that I'd written when you were a teenager. That's a, a very helpful uh, reminder. Uh, my own interest in, in Hawkins' work goes back uh, to when I was doing my own PhD in astrophysics. And I was at a conference when A Brief History of Time came out. And although I worked on um, the helium abundance in Big Bang cosmology, I never worked uh, uh, in the area that uh, Professor Hawking was. But I was fascinated by the not just the big science, the big thinking, um, the taking on of some of the, the things that other physicists would leave behind, but also how it was being interpreted in the media. And Carl Sagan in his forward to Brief History of Time said, this is a book about God or perhaps about the absence of God. Well, I was a young Christian doing a PhD in physics at the time. And therefore I was fascinated by uh, that intersection um, I was interested in the science and I was interested in what that meant for faith. And I remember having a late night conversation with Sir Robert Boyd, one of the great founders of British space science, who himself was a Christian, and saying to him, you know, is there something that we need to worry about in terms of Hawkins' approach? And he said, no. He said, I don't fully understand what it's about. But he said, uh, the God that I believe in is a God of the whole universe, uh, not to be confined just at the beginning. And if there's a scientific way of describing the very first moments of the universe, then we shouldn't be worried about that. And so it was, I think, because of the, the science, I think because of the theology. And as you rightly say, Justin, he became a superstar. I know that because he appeared on The Simpsons and he appeared on Star Trek The Next Generation and even Specsaver adverts. That's the surreal <laughs> test of being a superstar, yeah, I think, in absolutely. Western culture. Um, and there was something about his own personal life story, the courage, the disability, the illness, woven through these big questions in a way that uh, was just intriguing and fascinating and challenging. Mm. Well, it's a very you know suitable time to to bring a book out like this, um, and the area that that we're looking into changes all the time. There are always new theories being developed, um, and and Hawking himself obviously ch changed his mind, you know, on various things over the the decades. And we'll maybe get a kind of brief history, if you'll forgive the pun, of uh, some of his greatest hits, if you like, through the the sixties, seventies, uh, and eighties. Um, but let's introduce Phil uh, to the program. Um, Phil runs a great. Uh, YouTube channel uh, and Phil tell us sort of where this all began for you because I think to some extent it, it was kind of engaging actually with the Christian philosophical apologetics type discussions and the way they were using science that kind of prompted you to go out and start to really investigate as a layperson some of these theories and, and sort of try and present these films that, that kind of make them accessible to the general public. Right uh, well I started out uh, because I've always been fascinated by cosmology and who, who can't be fascinated by the origin of the universe? I mean, I think that's impossible. And I knew there were a, a whole bunch of interesting theories and I wanted to learn more about them. And it's hard to do because either there's, uh, it's, the stuff is too dumbed down or it's too technical. And there's very little in between. And um, so I thought, well, there'll be some material on YouTube. I was interested, the first film we made in cosmology was about a rival to string theory called loop quantum gravity and, and loop quantum cosmology. 
and there was so little about that those guys were not very good at publicizing themselves. So I thought, well, I'll find something on YouTube and there wasn't anything. And eventually someone said to me, if you want to watch it, why don't you make it? And so that's, that's what happened and it just snowballed from there. Yeah. Um, do, do you want to sort of, I mean, fair to say at this point that, that you probably had one of the last interviews with Stephen Hawking that he gave. Um, just explain how that came about because arranging an interview with Stephen Hawking um, was, was no mean feat. Uh, what, what was involved in actually making that happen? Um, well, so we basically had made a few films in this series called Before the Big Bang about competing models of the early universe. And I think the one that we had done before that was the one I was on the show to discuss last time I was on the show, which was with uh, Alan Guth, um, who invented the inflationary cosmology. And um, so I think that attracted uh, Stephen's team. And I worked with not just Stephen Hawking, but you know, Jim Hartle and Thomas Hertog, who are key people in, in uh, his sort of circle. And um, they were impressed with that film with Alan Guth. So I guess they basically let the guard down and said, yeah, OK, you can come right. and talk to Stephen. Yeah. Um, why don't we just see a little clip from one of the recent films um, and, uh, and that'll give a sense of the sort of people you're talking to and the kinds of subjects that you're discussing. Let's, let's watch that now. It is certainly a view quite commonly expressed now that we shouldn't simply give up that the Big Bang is a singularity, that we need a theory which describes that. Most people will say it's a form of quantum gravity. I have a view which is different from that, but nevertheless I have in common with that that we need a new theory. The real lesson of the singularity theorems is therefore that we need to combine the general theory of relativity with quantum theory in order to understand the origin of the universe. I don't think anybody believes that the universe started off with the singularity. Uh, that just tells us that Einstein's classical theory of general relativity breaks down. So that classical theory of gravity doesn't apply when you get to very high energies. Um, so it's replaced by some quantum theory, consistent quantum theory of gravity. String theory is a candidate for a theory like this. There you go, uh, a clip, and I do encourage you to, to head over to Phil's channel. I'll make sure there's a link, obviously, from the podcast info and here at the YouTube channel as well, if you're watching. Um, uh, let's come back to, to the book, uh, and then we'll, we'll, I'd be really interested to see what Phil's reactions are to it. Um, uh, I th obviously, we're going to have to do this in a very thumbnail way, Dave and David, but um, give us a brief overview, maybe I'll start with you, Dave, for this one, of some of the, the big things that Hawking did through his life, some of the, the, the big speculative theories that he uh, you know, put out there, and, and where you think he got it right, where you think maybe it's a lot more debatable, whether you know, those sorts of theories are the thing. Uh, and, and maybe I'll then come to, to David for sort of the the theological ramifications of, of what those those theories have done. But but you give us the, the science, if you like, first of all, if you would, Dave. Sure. Um, well, Hawking's life was a sort of love affair with gravity, really, or love and hate affair, I suppose. Um, and uh, what's, what's fascinating about gravity is that, of course, everybody knows about it. Everybody knows that things fall. Um, you don't have to tell even a young child that. Uh, but it wasn't written down mathematically until Isaac Newton did it. And even when he did that, which was the huge breakthrough, and he was able to come up with some equations that described it, he still had no idea what the mechanism was. So he actually writes in Principia, you know, I leave it up to the interested reader to try and figure out why my equations work. I, I know that they do, but I don't know why. Um, and, uh, and then you skip forward, uh, a couple of centuries and up turns um, Albert Einstein and Einstein comes up with this mechanism which I think most people have probably seen in one form or another that what gravity is really doing is bending space um, so the presence of uh, mass um, bends the space around it uh, or the space time around it but I'm sure we can get into that later and um, and when Hawking begins his uh, PhD we're working in this uh, realm of Einstein's gravity of bendy space. And one of the things that had turned up in, in these theories were black holes. Uh, black holes were this idea that you know, a star could collapse inwards on itself. And, and as it does that, it gets denser and denser and denser. 
and that makes its own gravity stronger in those you know uh, more concentrated that pulls it in more that makes its gravity stronger that pulls it in more and you get a feedback loop and these black holes would end up um, at the end of them having these infinities you get to a point of infinite density or infinite curvature of space uh, and that was worked out by Roger Penrose who was one of the guests you saw on the uh, video earlier uh, they are called the singularity theorems and Penrose showed that um, a collapsing black hole would always end up in a singularity and what Hawking did in the mid 1960s in his PhD thesis is to say well if something that's collapsing in space-time ends up as a singularity then what happens if something is growing in space-time uh, and by that point there was a pretty convincing theory around that uh, the universe was expanding so Hawking said well I can think of the universe as um, being like a black hole collapse in reverse it, it's expanding it's growing and if when black holes collapse they collapse into singularities then the universe must have expanded out of a singularity. So that was his PhD thesis. He stuck a singularity at the beginning of the universe um, and then spent the rest of his life trying to get rid of it again, <laughs> along with everybody else. Um, he's not the, not the only person who's perhaps spent the rest of their life trying to undo their student years, but, but uh, he, he did it professionally. Um, uh, and then in the 1970s, an, another breakthrough achievement was that uh, he managed to get two theories, this theory called general relativity uh, of how gravity behaves and the theory of quantum mechanics, which is um, uh, the theory of how the other three forces in nature behave. Uh, well, normally those two theories don't play nice. They're mortal enemies. Uh, and when you put them in the same room, they, they're pretty, it's, pretty, it's not very long before they're smacking each other about the head a bit. Um, and, uh, and, and this has been a big problem now for a hundred years. We still haven't solved it. It's, it's one of the things that Phil uh, makes his video series on, you know, how do we get these, these two theories to play nice? Um, and by the way, Phil, uh, nice to meet you. And the, <laughs> nice to meet you too. <laughs> the, um, I, I can recommend the videos as a science teacher. I watch a lot of YouTube videos about physics and 90 plus percent of them. I wouldn't let anywhere near any of my students. Um, but I think yours are superb and I really, really enjoyed them. Thank um, you. Thank you. So keep making them. Thank you. Um, uh, well, anyway, in, so in 1975, Hawking managed to get one of the ideas uh, of quantum mechanics, which is particles popping in and out of existence. Uh, and one of the ideas in general relativity, which is black holes, to sit alongside each other, to behave well together. Um, and he was using some of the wave mechanics ideas of quantum mechanics and some of the uh, space-time ideas in general relativity. And instead of it all blowing up and instead of it all going wrong, he managed to get a consistent theory uh, that would say that black holes should be emitting radiation, which we now call Hawking radiation. And when he looked at what Hawking radiation would look like, it turned out to be this incredibly recognisable shape that any physicist, even in the late 1800s, would have recognised. Um, and although we haven't directly observed Hawking radiation yet, most physicists are pretty convinced that it's a, it's a sound theory. So Hawking's uh, big achievement was getting general relativity and quantum mechanics to play ball. And then in the 1980s, his third really significant breakthrough um, and again, I think one that gives a picture of his willingness to just think a little bit further or a little bit bigger um, than anybody else would, was to take uh, something called a quantum mechanical wave function, which are these horrendously complicated equations that are normally designed to handle single atoms. So it would even take the entire screen um, to write out the equations for a hydrogen atom, mm. uh, the simplest atom that we have. Uh, and, and we wouldn't know, for example, how to write down the wave function for a tennis ball. Um, but Hawking said, well, I'm going to write down the wave function for the entire universe. Um, and so, again, you see this willingness to, to just go where other people wouldn't go and think in a way that other people uh, had written off already. And, and so in the 1980s, uh, with Jim Hartle, who's another one that, uh, that Phil's worked with, um, they they wrote down this paper called the wave function of the universe so you've got the singularity at the beginning in the 60s you've got hawking radiation in the 70s and then you've got this idea in the 1980s of the wave function of the entire universe mm. um 
and uh, and they are incredible achievements. So when Brian Cox said that uh, we'll still be talking about Hawking's work in a thousand years, it wasn't just one of those things that you say that's nice about someone who's died. I think he really meant it, and we're still talking about it now. Um, yeah. I imagine there'll be plenty more to come. Yeah. Well, obviously that, that gives us, you know, probably enough <laughs> material to, to fill several shows. Uh, we'll, we'll see what we can get to in the course of the programme. But of course, we also want to talk about the, the, the ramifications for the God question as well. And, and in a way, um, by the end of his life, at least, Hawking was just as well known for, you know, the, the sorts of things he was saying in his books about God uh, as he was for the, for the physics. Um, so, David, you know, I remember when The Grand Design came out, which was really his, his last book published while he was alive. Um, he, he said some things along the lines of, look, physics is dead. And what I've been able to show... Uh, philosophy. Says, philosophy. Philosophy. Sorry, not physics. <laughs> philosophy is dead. Um, and, and that there's clearly no need for a creator God once, once we look at the science behind the beginning of the universe and so on. Uh, to what extent, you know do you think he got that right or wrong and um and and how was that actually played out i suppose some sometimes the media tends to make more of these things than than there is in, in actual fact yeah i think for me the the kind of crucial moment for professor hawkin was his report of uh, a conference that he attended at the vatican on cosmology uh, where uh, the current pope gave john paul ii gave an address at the end of this conference and said or what Hawking reported, the Pope said, was that um, science can only take you to a certain point in the history of the universe. It can't talk about the very beginning. At that point, that's where God comes in. Now, actually, the Pope didn't say that. Frank Tipler, another cosmologist, uh, looked at the transcripts and said that isn't quite what the Pope said, but that's what Professor Hawking heard. And in a sense, he wanted to say, well, hold on a moment, that's not right. So why can't science describe the very first moments of the universe? And so he used that uh, exploration of both quantum theory and gravity that Davis so eloquently described to apply to the very first moments of the universe. Why do you need a God who starts off the universe? If the universe is a big explosion, then many religious people interpreted that kind of um, um, misshapen view of the Big Bang as a way to try and prove God. And Hawkins said rightly, no, you don't need that. Why can't science describe the very first moments of the universe? Now, I think in Brief History of Time, he uh, left the door open a little bit in terms of uh, a belief in God. He certainly argued against a kind of God of the gaps who steps in and it has to be the cause of the universe. When he gets to the grand design and he introduces the concept of the multiverse, he's hardened up in his uh, view of God and is much, uh, much more forceful in saying there is no need at all for any kind of God in this. Now, to be honest, Justin, I've got a great deal of sympathy with Hawkins' approach on this. It seems to me that it's never been part of orthodox Christianity to try and prove God in some kind of logical or mathematical way. Uh, it's called the cosmological argument in temporal form, this kind of argument that who started the universe, it must be God. Now, Hawkins' views, as we'll come on to, uh, are still somewhat controversial. They don't convince every scientist and they don't give us the answer to every question. But in terms of his fundamental approach to say that science should be able to give descriptions or attempt to give descriptions of the physical universe. Um, both as a physicist and as a theologian, I'm very sympathetic to that. Okay. Well, that, that's a great way of teeing us up for the discussion today. And, and we obviously needed a bit of time to, to get into, you know, the, the whys and wherefores of, of uh, the book and so on. So what, what we'll do is go to our first break and then we'll come back with Phil and we'll see what he made of the book and, um, and some of the areas that he would like to, to talk about um, as we look at the, the uh, God, Stephen Hawking and the Multiverse. That's our discussion today. It's the title of the new book by David Hutchings and David Wilkinson, uh, tracing the way that Stephen Hawking changed the way we think about the universe and what the implications are for the God conversation. So we'll be back very shortly with uh, the second part of today's program. What I want to invite Roger to comment on is why couldn't the mental realm include an infinite consciousness? 
It's, it's too much like us. <laughs> it's it's too <laughs> much like, like putting it <laughs> like, yes, like the Greek views of the gods in some sense. They were like too much like but us. they were finite. <laughs> and contingent here, we're talking about a metaphysically necessary source. I admire this noble aspiration to find the highest possible ideal. It's almost as if you're proposing a new religion to meet this new challenge. It's not a new religion. Yes. What it is is something that sits in the same place. Mm. It addresses some of the same needs, but it is not founded on the same principle. If the New Testament says that Jesus did X, Y, and Z, did he do it or not? I don't think it's a story that's made by committee. Am I going to have a later literary genius who comes up with a great story like this, or am I going to say, no, Jesus is the genius, and somehow that story has basically been preserved? Welcome back to the second part of today's show. We're discussing God, Stephen Hawking, and the Multiverse. That's the title of a new book by David Hutchings and David Wilkinson. Uh, David Wilkinson is a physicist, theologian. Uh, David Hutchings, a physics teacher and author. And Phil Halper is my skeptical atheist guest on the show today, runs the YouTube channel Skydive Phil, where he puts out loads of interesting videos and interviews with leading cosmologists. Um, and he's read the book. Um, and Phil, be interested, first of all, on your overall response to the book and and then we'll start talking about some of the particulars that you maybe take issue with in the book. So what was your overall feel on this particular topic and book? Well, um, mixed feelings. On the positive side, it's really well written, really engaging. It's entertaining in places. I think, uh, as you said, that a lot of the science is very well explained. And when you, when you come away, you, your, your knowledge will be increased. Um, so, so there's a lot of good things to say about the book. Um, on the negative side, I found that there was a lot of, I felt misquoting of scientists and a lot of the conclusions weren't supported by, um, you know, some of the quotes that they actually had. Um, so I don't know if you want me to just go into some of the particulars. Well, why don't we start with sort of where Dave started, you know, back in the 1960s with singularities and so on, which, which to some extent is, is what Hawking is almost best known for, because I think it's the bit that's probably the, the most accessible of, of all of them. Um, this idea that he, his, his research pointed towards this idea of, of this beginning phase of the universe um, coming out of this singularity and so on. Um, and, and as Dave said, he spent the rest of his life trying to, to get rid of that uh, conclusion in one way or another. So what, what was your issue with the way singularities is dealt with um, so, in, in this particular book? Right. So they concluded, the two Daves concluded that the singularities are probably real. And I think the vast majority of cosmologists would completely disagree with that. And it's OK to take a contrary position. But I think you should say you're taking a contrary position. What they said was that this is the mainstream view. And the, how they defended that um, was, first off, they agreed that the Penrose Hawking theorem uh, does not stand up. It's not likely to describe the world. And there are some technical reasons why that's true. But I think we should skip over those. Um, but then they go on to the bourdais guthrie vilenkin theorem. Now, last time I was on the show, I'd interviewed Alan Guth and he was very clear that theorem does not prove the universe has a beginning, does not prove there's a singularity. But Alex Valenkin had in the past said that it does. So there's a conflict. So since then I've, I've interviewed Alex Valenkin and, and he basically now is with Guth. Um, so, he, so to quote you, um, he said, um, let me see if I can find a quote. His, um, let me see if I can find it. Um, what is called what is called the standard? This is Alex speaking now. What is called the standard big co big bang cosmology, which was the hot big bang, right? You start with a very hot, dense universe and begins at a singularity. So that picture, I don't think anybody believes. So, so <laughs> that's kind of important. It's not just Alex and Alan don't think this is real. Alex is saying, and other people have said this. They don't think anybody believes it. And, he, and Alex said, and again, I'm quoting him now, the theorem proves that inflation must have a beginning. The universe as a whole, it doesn't. The theorem doesn't say that. Um, so inflation is this period of very rapid expansion. We talked about that the last time I was on the show. And, and what the theorem says is that that has a beginning, but that does not prove the universe has a beginning. So uh, they also said um, well, textbooks have the singularity in them. 
Well, I have plenty of cosmology, cosmology textbooks and they all say the same thing. You can't trust the singularities. Nobody trusts them. They're, what they are is signposts to new physics. So Stephen's great contribution in terms of singularities was creating that signpost. But it's not proving there was really a singularity. That is just not a view held by virtually anybody in the field. I, I mean, I'd be interested, first of all, perhaps from Dave, and then we'll swap to David. What, what's at stake here with this singularity issue? Why, um, and, and, you know, what, what do we lose if we don't have the singularity in a sense that, that Phil believes that actually the, the majority of modern physicists don't actually believe exists in quite, quite the way that you've, you've perhaps suggested in the book? Well, I, th I think the problem with singularities uh, is that they involve infinities. And when you have infinities, it's very hard to do any other maths. Um, you know, three times infinity is infinity. Uh, and, and so you don't, it's very hard to get any new information out. I think it would be fair to say that nobody really wants the singularity to be there because it's a science killer. Um, but uh, um, I, I think also it's, it's really important as well to, to point out that a lot of this stuff is, it's called theoretical physics for a reason. It's, and and it, things swing one way and the other. And we've tried to reflect that uh, in the book. You know, um, I'll let David go into the, the science a little bit more. Um, what I would, where I have sympathy with Phil is that if, if he's been getting frustrated hearing Christians saying, oh, uh, the singularity is definitely there. And because of the singularity, there's a God. Um, then I would say, well, that's frustrating to me as well. Um, we, we went for probably, um, but a very, very ven gentle probably. Uh, I, I think uh, the, word, <laughs> the wording that we used um, was something along the lines of, let me see if I can find it. Um, uh, this is a wonderful glimpse of cutting edge quantum cosmology. It's full of opinions and gut instincts and even emotion. Um, this doesn't, of course, make it wrong, but it's a highly welcome reminder that quantum cosmologists are people too. Um, and uh, we had we'd spoken to a decent number of people on the issue. Um, it, I think it's still up in the air. We erred on the side of probably, I mean, Aaron Wall, who works in the office a couple of doors down from where Hawking worked, um, he's, he did a long series uh, of, of posts looking at all the different models out there. Um, and he said, uh, if you put all the physics information together, the conclusion I would draw is that we don't know for sure whether the universe began, but to the extent of our present day knowledge is an indicator, it probably did. He thinks that the singularity theorems might be extendable to quantum gravity. Um, and, uh, and then also John Barrow in 1994, way back in 1994, said one should be wary of the fact that many of the studies in quantum cosmology are motivated by the desire to avoid an initial singularity. Um, so uh, we came down on the side of probably. If we'd come down on the side of probably not, I don't think it would have made any significant difference to the overall message of our book. Okay. Um, and it's not something that I'm going to plant a flag in and say part of my apostles, I'm going to insert a singularity into my apostles creed. But I'll hand over to David. Well, 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 I'll come back to David in a moment. I'd just be interested in Phil's response to that. Um, and so, so what, what we're saying here is that um, when it comes to whether there's a singularity at the beginning of the universe, Dave and David in the book said, probably on the basis of what appears to be, you know, the consensus. Your view, Phil, is no, you don't think that is the consensus, actually. You think it, things are moved away from there being a, a consensus among physicists that there's a singularity. Um, I, I mean, is 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 this just because this is a, a changing landscape and, and things change and, and it's maybe... It's not just that. It's not just that. So first off, the Penrose-Hawking theorems had an assumption in them. And that assumption was that gravity is always attractive. Well, once we saw that the universe is accelerating in its uh, expansion, that assumption is known to be false. So, so then you have the Bordet-Guthen-Vilenkin theorem, but that doesn't, just doesn't tell you there was a singularity. And in fact, Aaron Wall on his blog said explicitly it doesn't, it doesn't have the implication that there's a beginning to the universe. Um, mm. So I just don't see, so, but the thing is, it's fine to say our, our view is probably, yes, there was a singularity. I mean, nobody knows, right? There could be. But um, what, what's, a, what's the problem I have with is how they got to that probably, yes. They said it was, there was written in textbooks, but I don't think that's not what my textbooks say. They said the Bordet-Guth-Vilenkin theorem says that. 
but it doesn't. And then they quoted Aaron Wall. Now, Aaron Wall, in his quote, I think he was very honest. He said, my view is that there probably will be something like the Penrose theorem, but other physicists don't agree. So, so if other physicists don't agree, then what justifies probably yes? I, don't, I can't see Well, it. let's come, come to David. David, you know, you, 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 you erred on the side of probably, yes, there is a singularity at the beginning of the universe. Um, Phil obviously feels like that's not where most scientists are these days in the field. What, 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 what would you say in response? I think Phil's got a point that there's a historical development going on. Um, and what we've got is a number of people, as Dave said earlier, uh, who want to find a way to avoid singularities. And I, I would be one of them myself. Um, I think uh, I've got sympathy with um, all of these views, which say there are ways to get away from singularities. Uh, and some of the quantum cosmologies and inflationary models allow us to do that. I think uh, that's why I'm not wedded to singularities. I don't think there's any... Um, there's any theological merit in a singularity. Uh, and I'm not going to uh, defend it very strongly. I, I think there is, a, there is a language issue here, and that is that um, what we mean by beginning. Now, in one sense, uh, beginnings are sometimes linked with causes. And sometimes beginnings are simply to say there was something and there wasn't something. Now, I, I think I'm of the view that um, our current consensus in terms of models is that um, uh, you don't have to have a cause to have a temporal beginning to the universe. I mean, if, there's a, if that beginning is about the beginning of the inflationary uh, process, that doesn't necessarily mean for me, either physically or theologically, that you need a cause. I think you can have an uncaused universe, which arises in a number of different ways. So when we talk about beginnings, we're not linking that to a singularity in order to say that we need a cause, or at this point, as Hawking heard the Pope say, physics can't deal with it. And that's why singularity is important. I, I think the, the the point, you know, obviously a lot of Christians and Christian apologists have, you know, jumped on the idea of a beginning of the universe and, you know, the potential implications, theistic implications of that. Um, I mean, in if, if say, we were to say, you know, actually, we don't think, you know, that the science is pointing in that direction anymore or whatever. Um, wh wh where does that leave God for you, for instance, Dave? What, what, you know, some people might say, well, well, what role does God have at this point then if God didn't start the whole show off, you know, if God isn't the cause of the universe? Um, does, does that mean, you know, that, that God is sort of made redundant effectively uh, because the science has sort of said, no, well, actually, it turns out we don't need God, which is effectively kind of what Hawking was saying in the grand design. Um, or, or is that a naive way of thinking about the role of God when it comes to the universe and, and so on? Well, for the vast majority of the church's history uh, over the last 2,000 years, um, Aristotle's cosmology held, and, and that was that the universe was eternal. Um, so the, if you looked at the, uh, the vast majority of Christians who have held some sort of faith in God or adhered to the Apostles' Creed, most of them would have um, at least been at peace with the idea of eternal universe if they were thinking about it much. Uh, Aquinas, he sort of breaks with Aristotle a bit. He, he likes Aristotle and he wants to take most of Aristotle's ideas, but he says there's nothing we can uh, recognize in nature. There's nothing that we can find out in nature that tells us whether the universe has a beginning or whether it's eternal. Um, I'm going to take it from scripture. Uh, the natural reading of scripture is that the universe does have a beginning, so I'm going to take it from there. But of course, most people are still quite happy with Aristotle after Aquinas as well. Um, and uh, so I would say that it cannot be totemic. It cannot be a key doctrine of the Christian faith if it's one that hasn't been believed or discussed or, or thought about all that much by the vast majority of Christians throughout, um, throughout Christendom. It, it's not in any creeds um, or anything like that. But I think the other, the other, we've got to be careful here, you know, because one of my frustrations as a teacher is that sometimes we present science um, as a sort of fait accompli or everybody knows what they're doing all the time and 
that article you saw in Nature last week is a fact. Um, real science isn't like that, it's, it's messy. And um, one of the things that I've tried to do in my teaching is show a bit of the messiness as well. Um, and I actually think that if we, if we do that more, we'll get more scientists um, because they'll realize that you can get stuff wrong a lot or you can go down dead ends a lot. Mm. Um, but I think the, you know, the, just to get back briefly to the, the singularity issue, um, the idea of general relativity um, has been backed up by observation, um, actually measuring things and, and backing it up. Um, it was general relativity then that led to the initial idea of a singularity. Um, and, and that's all observational. That's based on observation. Okay. Um, uh, general relativity has been verified. Now it may still turn out to be not the correct theory, but it, um, you know, it, it was an experimentally um, backed up theory and the stuff that we're talking about as alternatives, quantum gravity, um, they they are toy models. They, you know, my A-level students sometimes get annoyed because they say, well, oh, I've got to do this question, but I've got to ignore air resistance. You know, calculate how far this golf ball gets hit. You can ignore air resistance. Um, well, we're ignoring a lot more than air resistance when we're, when we're building these models. Um, and so all of the models that Phil features in his um, documentary series, they're toy models. They're not models of a real universe or of our universe. They make vast simplifications. They're speculative. And we're also, when you combine that with the idea that what you're trying to do is get rid of a singularity, then um, all you've got to do is a bit of creative maths and, and find some of these alternatives. So, um, you know, a singularity is still on the table. There's an interesting article um, written uh, by, I can't find it, uh, Brunneman and Tiemann. They say uh, they've done an analysis of loop quantum cosmology. Uh, and they say, concluding, um, the issue of the presence or the absence of a, the initial singularity in full loop quantum gravity remains open because you can study toy models, but you don't know what it's going to look like in the real thing. Um, and then even the pioneer of loop quantum cosmology, Martin um, Boat, I don't know how to pronounce it, but Phil, oh, you won't. It's pronounced Boat. Yeah, thank you. Mm -hmm. um, he uh, he he also makes this point. Look, we're making so many assumptions, and we've really got to be careful not to go too far. So he says a large number of models that have been analysed, um, they ignore a lot of the physics. Um, and his language is, is stronger than I would use and probably stronger than Phil would use. But he says, as a consequence, none of the broader claims hold up to scrutiny. Um, so I think we've got to present this messiness. Um, and I think also we should make the distinction that singularities, no one was looking for singularities. They turned up uninvited. Whereas solutions that don't have singularities are searched out. They are being looked for. That's where the focus is. Yeah. And, and, and obviously, as, as um, Dave said there, Phil, a lot of your videos have, have centered on kind of alternative theories, you know, that, are, you know that, that don't require a singularity for how the universe exists and came into being and, and so on. Um, at, and to that extent, um, I mean, we could spend the rest of the, the program, you know, what little time we've got talking about the singularity, we will try and do something else as well. But, but for, for you, it, are you just simply trying to say, look, the, the science, there's interesting science elsewhere with different possibilities, but also, I guess, with that proviso that we're looking at simplified models and, you know, universes, you know, this is one way of sketching out the universe that it could have looked like this if we take into these kinds of considerations. I mean, to what extent does it feel like we can ever get to a real kind of, yeah, this is definitely the way it all happened kind of view of, of the universe in, in your opinion, Phil? Well, we can hope we know one knows, right? So, um, but I do think that um, these aren't just tr clever maths to try and get rid of a singularity. So in loop quantum cosmology, which uh, David mentioned there, uh, they're building the theory uh, and, and they built that theory for like 20 years before they ever looked at cosmology. And in cosmology, all models are simplified models. You can't do cosmology without that. So, so when people say, oh, the universe had a beginning, that's also a simplified model. So it's not like mm -hmm. one is and one isn't. Um, mm -hmm. So, and I should also add that Martin um, is basically taking a view that uh, the Hart or Hawking model is actually what's implied by loop quantum cosmology. Now that is a view not shared by most people in loop quantum cosmology. They think that actually from the full theory, there's something called spin foam cosmology, where they take the full theory and uh, they also see that the singularity is resolved. 
And Martin thinks their singularity is resolved as well. He thinks it's resolved differently to the majority of people working in that field. But there's an agreement there that, that so Martin thinks it's resolved as well. well. Well, now you're on first name terms, obviously, with these people, Phil, but, um, <laughs> yeah. the, and many people may be losing the track here. But, but if I can try, and I think what, where we've got to is, is your, what you're now referring to, the hartle Hawking model, is what's yeah. sometimes called the no boundary proposal, right. yeah. which, which is a, a way of kind of, um, well, do you want to give a go at explaining it? Because you'll do a better job than me, Phil. But but what what does that represent in terms of this was another significant development that um, yeah. Dave mentioned very briefly uh, just at the beginning yeah. of the program from from Hawking. But what does the Hartle Hawking uh, model, this no boundary proposal, mean? What what is it, and and how does that play into the this whole question over whether there's a singularity and so on? Okay. So first of Dave Dave summed it up reasonably well. It's it's describing a quantum mechanical wave function of the universe. It's quite a complicated model, and out of all the ones that we've covered in our video, it's the one that I, I find the hardest to try and explain and, uh, and get my own head round. Uh, so what I should say is watch our video. We, ex we have Hawking and Hartle and Thomas Hertog uh, explaining. But simply, right, to try and simplify things, what they say is that when you go back to the Big Bang, instead of having three dimensions of space and one dimension of time, you have four dimensions of space and one dimension of time. And uh, sorry, four dimensions of space, no dimensions of time. And um, so you get the sort of rounding off. There's no singularity there. there. It's a bit weird because it does not go back eternally into the past, but there's no point on this surface that can be identified as the first point because all the points on the surface are equally valid as any other. However, the other, there's some other complicating things, which is actually there's sort of two types of time, one called imaginary time, one real time. And uh, don't mistake that for imaginary meaning fictitious. It's, it's something in mathematics, mm. which people that know mathematics will understand. <laughs> but uh, bo bottom line is two types of time. And this rounding off happens in one of those types of time, imaginary time. But in real time, you can also trace the evolution of the universe back. And then you have a sort of bouncing universe. Um, uh, well, it looks like a sort of hourglass. Um, so that's the sort of brief summary of the model. But uh, uh, bottom line is it's more complicated than that. And, uh, <laughs> well, you, you could read their, no, you could read their book or watch my film, and there'll be a yeah. thorough explanation. Well, I, I well, Phil describes it very well, uh, actually. I mean, thank you, Phil. Uh, very helpful indeed. I, I think that the key here is just as you describe it, that when we get to the early universe, we're talking about a whole different way of thinking, not just different theoretical models, and so how the dimension of time effectively fades away and becomes a dimension of space is a, a particular way of trying to think about these things. And Professor Hawking himself often said that he found it difficult to find a model in the real world to describe what was actually going on at the early universe. So a number of things follow out of this. The first is that you've got to speak the language and trust the language of mathematics. This is one of the great uh, beliefs of physicists, that there is an elegance to mathematics and a power of mathematics to explore those things which go beyond the tyranny of common sense, which actually uh, allow us to think about things in a completely different way. I think secondly, you've got to accept that uh, some of these models, uh, as Dave was talking about, do have um, the possibility of observational testing and some of them may not. You may have to decide between different models on the grounds of um, the subtlety or the elegance or the beauty of the mathematical model. And what Hawking was doing uh, and what we try and uh, uh, represent in the book is that Hawking was, was doing that by saying, uh, I'm trying to understand the very first moments of the universe. I don't have a consistent model to allow me to do that. But if I did, these would be the type of things that would be important to that kind of model. The use of imaginary time, the use of um, four dimensions of space. Now, uh, I don't want to undermine Hawking or other people's suggestions on this, because actually when you get to these very first moments of the universe, uh, you have to proceed in this um, uh, humble, uh, yet uh, trusting in mathematics and trusting in a sense of the deeper laws of physics uh, and the hope 
Uh, and Phil mentioned that word earlier, and I, I want to rein, rein, reinforce that, the hope that there is a way of understanding the early universe. Um, uh, and we go through different models at different times in the history of cosmology. But we all have this hope that there will be some kind of solution that allows us to understand the early universe. Yeah, I, I suppose what, what I'm interested in is, is, you know, what motivations are at stake as well, because um, is, is there any sense, Phil, that, that you get the sense that, um, I mean, that Hawking and other scientists don't like the singularity because of any potential, you know, ways in which it could be used for theistic purposes and so on? Or, 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 or is it just that they just don't believe that that's a, a satisfactory way of understanding the universe? Well, I mean, what, because obviously some Christians will latch onto these things and say, that's useful for me trying to prove God. Um, the, the danger is equally that some scientists might have some kind of a bias against certain explanations because they feel like that that they're not comfortable with some of the, you know, some of the implications of it themselves. But what, what do you think, Phil? I mean, I think that um, everyone has a bias, and so we can't escape that. But there are real scientific issues to resolve the singularity because quantum mechanics and general relativity are our best descriptions of, of the universe, and there is real contradiction between them. So what they're trying, I think, is that it's uh, not so much, I think most physicists don't care about the religious question, to be honest. That's my experience. They're just not interested. And there are many physicists that are Christians that don't care about whether the universe had a beginning. So in the book, they quote Don Page, um, and, and he certainly believes the universe is likely to be eternal into the past, but he doesn't care. He thinks oh, that doesn't matter to God. So um, I think there's a real scientific problem to resolve the, the singularity. It's, it's true that we all have our biases, but, um, but I don't think that's really what's happening here. I, th I think... They want to solve a puzzle, which is how to resolve general relativity and, and quantum mechanics. And the no boundary proposal, I think, is um, you know, a very powerful idea. We don't know whether it's right, and it is speculative. But I don't feel like in the book it, um, it was treated fairly. Uh, and we okay. can go into that if you want. Well, 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 just briefly, yeah, give yeah. us a sense of why you don't feel it was quite done justice then. Yeah, and, so and basically... Kind of respond to that. Yeah, so basically... Um, it's a controversial idea and there's a lot of this, it's got a huge number of citations. That tells you, it's got 3,650 citations in the scientific literature for that one paper that Hartle and Hawking wrote. That's a lot. So that tells you scientists are, are taking it seriously. There's a lot of pros and cons, a lot of going back and forth. And I feel what they did was quote all the, you know, the negative uh, citations and ignore the positive ones. And, and the, the thing that annoyed me the most was that there was a, a bit where they said, Jim Hartle is probably losing faith in the idea because he said, I'm not committed to its truth. And I don't think that represents a losing faith. And I actually wrote to Jim and I, I asked him, does it represent a loss of faith? And, and I, I'll tell you what our conversation was. I quote you, I, I, what I said to Jim was, I've always had the impression that the no boundary proposal is exactly that, a proposal to be explored and theorists are never um, you know, tied to having faith uh, in their proposals or committed to their truth anyway. So for the authors to make, for the authors to take this comment to apply a change of view seems misleading. Um, and he said, uh, this is his reply. He said, if the universe is a quantum mechanical system, it has a quantum state. The no boundary wave function is a promising candidate um, for that state because coupled with suitably, a suitable dynamical theory, it predicts features of our large scale universe that we observe today. I continue to work on that and I'm in accord with your last paragraph. So that's why I read my last paragraph because he said, you know, he agreed. Yeah. It's, it, I think there's a misquoting going on there. It creating an impression that the founder with Hawking is losing faith because he said he's not committed to its truth. But I think scientists, when they propose these ideas, they shouldn't be committed to their truth anyway until the data comes back unambiguously. This is reality, and that hasn't happened yet. Well, there you go. He, he went. He he went to the main man, Dave. Um, he's dobbed you in, uh, frankly. Well, hey, at least it's brought the book to to uh, Hartle's attention. But but what do you say? I mean, obviously, we're talking about a, you know a paragraph in a book here. But what what, what were you trying to say? What was your assumption or, or your thoughts uh, in terms of his? what he does, you know, currently think about, about the no boundary proposal. 
Uh, sorry, about what Jim Hartle thinks. Yeah, yeah. I mean, what were you trying to express about Jim Hartle's potential, this, this, this phrase you used of, of potentially losing faith in the no boundary proposal? Well, I mean, I will defer. I'm quite happy to defer to Phil if, if Phil's got direct contact with him. I mean, <laughs> what, what, one, one of the terrifying things about committing to paper, or as Phil will know, keep committing to YouTube, although I suspect a YouTube edit is a lot easier than, uh, <laughs> than going back to book, is that, um, you know, when you write 80,000 words on something, you're going to write a couple of words that might need to be refined afterwards. Um, and I think also when you're writing a book about quantum cosmology, even the seven months between submitting the manuscript to the publisher and it coming off the print line means that the game might have changed completely anyway. Um, I mean, I, I did I have skin in the game in terms of whether or not I wanted to back Hawking's No Boundary proposal? Not really. Um, I wanted to write a fair uh, description of it. Um, and I spoke to, tried to speak to plenty of people in the process um, and pick their brains and read the papers. And like Phil, I'd say it is the most difficult thing that I've ever come across. Um, and, uh, uh, but um, I did get an email from Don Page. So we can, we can do this naming thing. <laughs> which I think um, who, who, and he, for, for the listeners, he's... Um, uh, former student of Hawking, they then worked together for decades, co-authored, uh, I think, seven or eight papers, something like that, um, and were good friends. He's famously one of the people that uh, Hawking had a bet with. I think Hawking seemed to have bets with uh, pretty much every big hitter out there. Um, and Don Page wrote to me saying, um, I've greatly enjoyed reading God, Stephen Hawking, and the multiverse, and I thought you gave a very tr fair treatment of Stephen Hawking and of his views and explained them clearly. Um, I mean, we are at the mercy, aren't we, of of the people who are right at the top of the tree. Um, and uh, but I think it is true that um, the no boundary proposal was this massive watermark moment, a watershed moment. Um, it, it changed the game. It's the first genuine attempt at putting quantum mechanics and, and general relativity together. Um, it, it may be right and it may be wrong, but this is an area of physics, quantum gravity is an area where, you know, Sean Carroll and, uh, and others are saying, look, we don't really know what we're talking about. We're just, mm. you know, we're just having a crack at it. And um, I, I think that's really important for it to come across at just how, um, how complicated and difficult and speculative these are. These are playing around with equations and seeing what happens. Then it's nothing like the kind of physics I do in my lab where we hang a mass on a spring and we see, does the spring get longer by the sure. same amount each time? And we can write down a law. I mean, we just don't even know how to write down a lot of the equations for this stuff, let alone solve them. David, looked like you wanted to come in and say something. Yes, uh, just to just to say, I, I don't have anybody to quote. I'm afraid, either <laughs> for or against. Um, <laughs> but I, I do have a little bit of experience of working as a cosmologist. Not anything as um, as uh, terrific as some of the names that we've been talking about. And I just wanted to pick up one thing, which is that this is not just a, uh, a, a, a place of mathematics. It's also a, a judgment of scientists. Science is a human activity. And you have a number of people uh, who are providing theories. And partly it's about who they are as people. They have their own backgrounds and interests and cultures. They are, have their own uh, preferences in terms of how you judge elegance and how you judge that which applies. And there is a sense in which I want to both agree and disagree with Phil on the nature of how scientists relate to scientific theories. Um, yes, one actually has a humility before the facts as Huxley used to talk about science as. And therefore you, you propose something and you want to see it tested by the evidence. But it's also something that often as a scientist you've given birth to. It's something that uh, sitting in my son's bedroom you see grow with years and uh, you have some belief, some confidence, some uh, uh, emotional attachment to. And science is, is this very messy activity where you've got a number of personalities as well as the hard data and the the theoretical framework. 
Now, when we come and Phil rightly said, I mean, the Hartle Hooking paper is um, hugely cited. It is um, one of those moments within the scientific framework where uh, you say that is someone planting a foot in it and really that's going to be there forever. How people interpret not just the theory, but the way that that theory is given birth to questions as well as other theories is a very complicated process. And how scientists talk about their own theories is very complicated as well. And I, I think for me that that's a reminder, not just that science is a, is a wonderful, exciting thing because it's about data, it's about mathematical models, but it's also about real people. Um, uh, real people striving to understand more. Uh, and that's not to demean science. That's actually to say it's just brilliant. It's fascinating. And that allows us, some of us, to write uh, books where we occasionally might get it wrong and for Phil to make such brilliant videos about the views, not just the views of the scientists, but the scientists themselves and their own personal stories. Well, look, um, we're nearly out of time. And I just wanted to spend a few minutes uh, in the final segment of our program to, to talk about um, ultimately where do we come from and, and sort of some of the statements you make towards the end of the book, gentlemen, and, and Phil's response to that. So if we've time, we'll, we'll, just, we'll just finish off with, with that. Um, so much else that we hope to, to cover, which inevitably we haven't been able to. But um, we'll go to our final break and we'll come back as we continue to discuss God, Stephen Hawking and the multiverse. My guests are David Hutchings, David Wilkinson and Phil Halper. If you listen to Unbelievable with Justin Briley on Premier Christian Radio and enjoy the conversations between Christians and skeptics, then this is the perfect app for you. For the latest updates, podcasts, videos, articles, bonus content and much more, download the Premier Unbelievable app today. Well, it's been such a fascinating discussion today. I always love it when I, I learn a lot in the process of both reading a book in preparation for a show and, and then having a conversation as well. Um, God, Stephen Hawking and the Multiverse is available now. It's published by SBCK. I'll make sure there are links to the book and Dave and David as well um, from today's show. And of course, Phil Halper, who's joined us on the program today and his YouTube channel, Skydive Phil. Um, I mean, we've talked, you know, about some of the theories, the singularity, the, the no boundary proposal and so on. And, and well done, everyone, for keeping it at a level where we can more or less follow along uh, as, as non-scientists as well. But, um, you know, I, I think that the point you come to near the end of the book, gentlemen, is is more about sort of where does this leave us in terms of, you know, the idea that we are created by God ultimately. Um, and um, I, I don't know, maybe we'll start with you, Phil, just, just to give a sense of what, how you felt that was characterised. And again, thank you, Dave and David, for being willing to, to sort of put yourself in the firing line for this grilling from, from Phil. But um, what, what, I think you, 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 you disagreed ultimately, and perhaps unsurprisingly, with their answer to the question of where did we come from then? Yeah. So do, do you want to tell us what, what you felt their answer was, Phil, and then we'll, we'll see what Dave and David have to say in response? Uh, their answer was Jesus, if I remember rightly. Um, and so, there, I mean, there was a lot of scrutiny on the no boundary proposal, and rightly so. It's, it's a controversial idea, and as I say, a lot of back and forth. And then they proposed Jesus as the answer instead. And I didn't feel like there's a lot of difficult problems with saying that. I mean, trying to reconcile Genesis, which says the stars were created after trees, uh, which says there's a solid dome of the sky, which says... Um, you know, that humans were sort of created, you know, out of dust, um, which has no mention of billions of years or galaxies or anything like that. How you reconcile that is very difficult. I'm not saying it cannot be done. I mean, I, well, I think it can't be done, but I, I, there are arguments to be had about that. And I felt that what they should have done was address that head on. And, and uh, you know, I was waiting for that. How, how are you going to square Genesis with with uh, Jesus, uh, you know, with science, because it looks like they're completely different. You know, Genesis has primordial water. Well, science does not think water is primordial. How are you going to square this? And I was waiting to read what they would come up with, because there are some, you know, proposed uh, solutions to this problem. And I didn't feel there was anything. It was just okay. Jesus is the answer. I mean, uh, perhaps that's the subject for another book at some point, Dave. Right. Um, but but what, what's your, I, I mean, do you want to maybe, I don't know if you can quote from the book, what, what you actually said in response to that, that ultimate big question of where, where do we come from? Um, is it as simple as, as, as Phil put it? Well, Jesus is the answer, essentially. 
Uh, well, yeah, pressures of word count, <laughs> but, all, but also um, the brief of the book really was to interact with, with Hawking. There are plenty of other books that cover the relationship between Genesis and, and cosmology. I'm sure you could stick a whole load on the, uh, uh, on the notes to this YouTube, um, and I'm sure that Phil can get stuck into plenty of them. Um, yeah, it wasn't in the brief, but what I think was really interesting and what we decided to finish on is how can it be that you can have two people working in the same field, agreeing on the same data, um, and agreeing on the same laws of physics um, and all this sort of stuff, and, and yet one of them looks at the universe and says, well, God made this. And the other one looks at the universe and says, oh, there's absolutely no need for a God at all. Um, and the two people we picked were Hawking and Page because they work so closely together. And also because Page wrote one of the strongest defenses of Hawking's model. Um, and, uh, and so they're not even disagreeing about <laughs> the start of the universe necessarily. Um, well, why, did, why have they come to different conclusions? And there's a, an interesting quote um, from Page. He says, um, I personally think it might be a theological mistake to look for fine tuning and, and other parts of cosmology as, as the sign of the existence of God. In other words, I regard the death and the resurrection of Jesus as the sign given to us, that he is indeed the son of God and the savior he claimed to be. So what we're trying to do in that last bit is saying, look, you're, you're going to have to go somewhere else for your evidence. I mean, the analogy that I would give is imagine that you go with a friend to a zoo and you both want to know, are there elephants at this zoo? Well, what you could do is go to the gift shop and you could see whether they sell elephants, right? And, and someone might say, well, if the gift shop sells elephants, then it's more likely that this zoo has elephants in it somewhere, right? And if it doesn't sell elephants, it's less likely. Um, and so you could make a consistency argument. But if you really want to know whether there are elephants at the zoo, you know, you've got to try and find an elephant enclosure and, and see if there are any elephants in it. Um, and, and I think that cosmology on its own ain't going to get you anywhere. And, the, and in the same way that Phil feels frustrated when he comes across Christians saying, oh, you know, the universe had a beginning, therefore God. Um, you know, I find myself frustrated when someone says, hey, we've built a model of a universe that creates itself, um, therefore no God. Um, and, and maybe Phil could identify with that and say, well, hang on, you can't hang your hat on on that you know that that's about elephants in the gift shop it's not about elephants in the zoo um and so where else do you look well god in the bible god has said look i i've revealed myself by actually coming to earth as a human being and um how am i supposed to prove that i've done that well i prove it by doing miracles that nobody else can do um and also by uh telling everyone that when I die, I'm going to come back to life again three days later and then doing it. Um, and so I think that I, you know, what I would say to Phil is, um, I'm sorry if people have given you a hard time um, uh, by debating the beginning of the universe with you. And I'm sorry if people have given you a hard time for any other reason either. Um, but, you know, what my, the skin in the game for me is that I want people to find Jesus I want them to discover that there is a God that made this universe I do believe that will make their life better now and I also believe that it will make their life better for eternity and that's my motivation for writing a book like this and it's my motivation for coming on and talking to Phil um, even though I know he might have uh, more <laughs> more knowledge or more personal contacts than me <laughs> you know I, I'm not interested in winning an argument about singularity what I want is for him to find Jesus um, and, uh, and um, so I just encourage him to go and look for the elephant yeah. enclosure um, and, and, and ask about these things like did Jesus rise from the dead and so on let's not let's not st get out of the gift shop yeah yeah <laughs> well I, I don't think any uh, you know Phil Phil as I know as someone I've I've spent time with and, and been around uh, I, I I've always found you Phil to be exceptionally open to investigating these things and and obviously as yet unconvinced but but obviously um, I, I've always found you to be a very fair interlocutor and, and you know I've I've had this treatment from Phil myself guys you know I did a video um, which Phil roundly criticized and I I changed in when I wrote my book which he also disagreed with by the way um, uh, I changed one or two things on the basis of some you know some conversations I'd had with Phil but um, 
the but you know we're all in this we're all learning together and and obviously we're, we're all coming out at different perspectives never nevertheless at the end of this um phil it's been great having you on the show thank you so thank much you. thank um, you very and, much for having uh, me. it's been a really interesting dialogue um uh, thank you as well david um for for being on and um i mean just from your perspective david what 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 are you hoping like a phil or someone who is a christian will go away from with this book if it's not sort of a uh, there is a beginning, therefore God kind of answer, which evidently you're saying is not what you're aiming to do with this sort of a book. What what are you hoping is is the outcome for for the reader, be they Christian or non Christian, of, of your book? I, I think for the Christian, it's to be excited by science. So there's something about sometimes Christians are either fearful of science, or they want to employ science uh, to back up their own uh, faith, or sometimes insecurity about faith. And really, there's something that both Dave and I share, which is we love science and we love the, the scientists involved. We love the, uh, the data. We love the speculation. We love the debate that we've been having this evening uh, about the various models. And we wanted to use Stephen Hawking and the public profile that he had to say, look, science is something that I believe is a gift from God. Therefore, if you're a Christian, don't use it just for theological purposes and don't be afraid of it. Enjoy it and listen to science as it is with all its complexity and its messiness. And I hope that for those who aren't Christians, they might see that here's a way of actually not just holding together science and faith, but actually uh, there are many of us who are passionate about science and who've used the same rigor, we hope, in exploring issues of the Christian faith, to say, you too can explore it. Now, it's right to make the point that um, we come to different conclusions. We make different judgments. We do that within science. Has been, we've been illustrating that for the past hour or so. But that's also true in Christianity. Christianity doesn't present you with a series of simple equations that convince you that there is one answer. Ultimately, Christianity's claim is that there is a personal God who has revealed uh, God's self within space-time history supremely in the life, death, and resur resurrection of Jesus. And there's something to think about and talk about, debate, and then you need to make a judgment yourself on it. And in a sense, if we can offer that space for people to have this kind of conversation, I'll be glad if that's what the book mm. does. Well, as I say, there was, there was so much more we could have covered, but haven't had time to um, multiverses and quantum theory and all sorts. Um, maybe maybe that's one for another show. Maybe we can even do it in person as well. Um, maybe time. we yeah. are doing it. Maybe we are yeah. doing it somewhere else. <laughs> exactly. Probably millions yeah. of times over. With, yeah. But, um, it, anyway, yeah. Great, great way to finish the show. Um, thank you very much, um, all of you, for coming on the line Thanks, everyone. and uh, talking about this. Uh, as I say, links uh, in the description from the podcast and the video to the book where you can find out more about that and, of course, to Phil's channel as well. And, um, and uh, I do hope uh, you've enjoyed today's show for the moment. Uh, Dave, David and Phil, thanks for being with me. Thank you, everyone. Thank you. Bye-bye. Thank you. Bye-bye. For more conversations between Christians and skeptics, subscribe to the Unbelievable podcast. And for more updates and bonus content, sign up to the Unbelievable newsletter.